Christine Dye, and I moved to Kalispell about five years ago from Colorado Springs, where I had moved from California, so most of my life I spent in California. And kind of late in life, I got interested in horticulture and gardening, did some classes at a community college. A friend and I did cut flowers and sold them at a farmer's market for a couple of years, which was really fun. Um, and we you know, decided, well, we're never going to make a living doing that. So I got interested in California native plants and then spent seven years at a native plant nursery, um, the other side of Silicon Valley, before moving to Colorado. And at that point, I was realizing how challenged our food system is and wanting to grow food. I had a little granddaughter that I followed to Colorado and I just thought, you know, I want her to have the best, healthiest food possible. And the 11 years I spent in Colorado Springs, most of that time there were water restrictions, it was drought. And Colorado Springs is on the east side of the Rocky Front. 6,000 feet in elevation, so the sun is really intense. Um, <clears throat> plants dry out real quickly. And then at 38 degrees latitude, you don't have the really beautiful long summer days that we have here at 48 degrees latitude. It makes a huge difference, you know, in May through July when we have the really long days of sunlight. The, the plants just take off. So. This is the best place I've ever gardened, even though you have to do winter. <laughs> the summer months are, are wonderful. And I've been able to grow enough to pretty much get me through the growing season. Um, I still have food in the freezer, cauliflower and um, frozen leaves. I still have a few winter squash in the basement. Um, so you can do a lot in a small backyard. So what I was hoping to do is I have two PowerPoints, and the first one is the first growing season I was here, and the second one is last year's growing season. So the very first um, summer that I was here, I did nothing. I just observed the backyard, and I ended up buying this little house because the backyard was just grass and dandelions. It was wide open, um, perfect for starting a garden and so this is a view looking to the east so it's really open i've got you know the really beautiful old maple trees on the blocks either side but the yard is really fairly open it gets really good sun so if you want to grow vegetables <coughs> um, a lot of them really need a, a nice amount of sun so that's something to consider and then this is a, a, a view of the, the beds that are prepped with a stepping stone, I had dug the grass out of those the summer previously and then got some compost from Kalispell Creamery. That is a wonderful resource. You can take a pickup out there and they will you know, bring your backhoe and fill your pickup and it's 10 or $20. I think it's $10 a scoop. Um, and it's, it's clean, it's good compost. So I, have done that every year after discovering that is a, a good resource. Okay, the next thing I did is I purchased five raised beds. And it's pretty easy if you've got woodworking skills to build your own raised beds. You can buy some um, two by six duck fur and just you know nail the ends together. But this you saw on Craigslist and there's cedar. And they had um, the top board along the edge, and they're, they're fairly tall. So I decided to splurge and spend the money for the raised beds. And um, I'm glad I did. You know, it's just a really nice way to contain the garden. Um, and it's, it's, you can sit on the edge, which is kind of nice if you're going to harvest or weed. And these are the other two beds, and you can notice the um, shade pattern. So that's one thing to consider. This area has shade in the late afternoon. So I placed these here with the intention of putting the greens in there. 
things like lettuce and chard <coughs> and kale that aren't going to really appreciate that hot afternoon sun. Okay, now this is a picture of how I, I got some pond liner and I stapled the pond liner to the inside of these beds. That way it protects the, the wood from the soil and hopefully the wood lasts quite a bit longer. If you do that, it's a little bit of an investment of time and material, but I think it will extend the life of those raised beds quite a bit. And the next thing I did is uh, put cardboard down, and this was just on top of grass. So you put cardboard down and you put the raised bed on top of the cardboard. And then I took a bunch of prunings from some old lilac bushes and put those as a bottom layer. And that's just organic matter. It's going to break down over time. It'll hold water and it fills up space because it's a lot of space to put potting soil or compost into. So you can do, uh, you know, fill it with the wood. And there's actually an Austrian gentleman, um, Seth Holzer, that created this technique. They call it Hugo culture, where you bury logs in the ground and mound the soil up and then plant into it. And as those logs decompose, they're feeding the soil organisms which feed the plants. So it's just a, kind of a, a, an interesting technique. And this shows the wheelbarrow with a bunch of um, dry garden material from the summer before. That was going to be the next layer on top of the cardboard. And then I did put another layer of cardboard on top of the, the twigs. And then what you want to do is you want to wet it down really well. You want the cardboard to be thoroughly wet because if you don't, you're going to have dry spots um, to discourage roots. and then organisms in the soil are going to be able to come up and decompose the cardboard as easily either. And then this just shows that, that next layer, kind of spread it out. And then um, I, I, the next layer on top of the, the rough debris is going to be the compost from the creamery. And then on top of that to plant into is going to be just potting soil. And I like the happy frog or the forest um, ocean because those are organic and they've got good ingredients. They put the mycorrhizal fungi in there and those help um, feed the soil organisms. Basically what you want to do is to garden well you want to feed your soil, you want to grow the soil. It's the bacteria, the fungus, all the little creatures that are making the minerals and all the nutrients available to your to your plants. So that they do put in the happy frog and the, the ocean forest. Oh, are you mixing the potting soil and the um, compost. And compost or are you layering? No, I'm just layering. And how deep are your beds? Um, you know what? I think they're like about a foot. Okay, thank yeah. you. And then inside I purchased a grow light. This is in my basement and um, started just a bunch of cool season vegetables, the, the kale, the lettuce, the, um, the leeks, the onions. And um, this was like late February. And then, you know, three or four weeks later, they've grown to this point where they're, they're pretty much ready to be transplanted. So I built these little boxes to transplant into so it's just um, some cedar the, the one by twos and a little hardware cloth on the bottom and I measured so they would fit into my little cold frame so this cold frame I've had for about 10 years and it's polycarbonate which is um, it, <coughs> it has it holds air space so it, it's pretty good for um, insulating and more, it's better than plastic is the whole thing. So these are, you know, the, all the, the cool season veggies I transplanted into the potting mix into these little um, containers and then they, they stayed there for, you know, another three weeks or so. 
and then they were transplanted into the bed. So this is the bed, and you can see the potting soil layer on top. And uh, there are just a million different patterns you can do for planting, but I like the mixed planting where you have some different textures. And um, so this is most it's lettuce and kale. So what I did was, um, these are four by eight beds, and I did two bags for each bed. And so that's May 18th, and then this is by May 25th. So this is the thing about the light here and the latitude. That time of year, everything just seems to just explode with growth. It's like you just go, wow, this is amazing how fast everything grows. And then this is like June 6th. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so it's just, uh, and then this is June 27th. This was, um, there are beets on the edges and, and um, scallions, and those are started inside in the basement. But then the carrots are just sowed directly into the bed. And that's probably, you know, six weeks previously that I put the carrots in there. And it's, you know, it's a little bit of um, work to figure out how to stagger things like that, but the carrots, they're going to stay in that center for quite a while before I'm ready to harvest them. Um, the beets, you can harvest the greens. Beet greens are delicious. I'll go cut some and just saute them in the morning for breakfast, and then you add an egg and scramble it into it. Um, so that's kind of a way of just harvesting the beet greens while the, the beet is growing. And if you don't harvest too much, it's not harming the beet in its growth. And then scallions, you just pull them out as you go. And then this is um, June 27th. So this is the, there's the old saying, knee high by the 4th of July for your corn. <laughs> it's kind of almost there. So this is local seed. Um, we've got Good Seed Company and Triple Divide Organic Seed are two local companies here. So I try to buy seed from the folks that are growing it locally. Um, this is Fisher's earliest. And so sowed that inside April 19th. And it was protected in the cold frame and then you know, early June, put it in the garden. And then this is July 7th, so this is winter squash. I, winter squash takes some space, but I think they're so valuable. They're really nutritious. Um, they keep through the winter. And so um, this was sown directly into the soil May 17th. The soil is warming up generally by then and it takes the seeds a little while to germinate and by the time they have you're kind of past that frost um, potential and this is planted I, I planted um, four apple trees and a couple plums and so you've got all this open space around the, the fruit trees and when they're young it's just perfect to kind of incorporate some of the squash they can just sprawl around the, um, the fruit trees. Okay, so this is July 7th, and this is basil that I purchased from Terrapin um, Farm, and she's an organic grower that does a wonderful job. You can go out to the farm late <coughs> May, and she even does an open house and purchase starts, or she sells at the farmer's market as well. I've always had really good luck with her plants. And this is July 7th, so this was a tomato start from from her farm. When do you start your tomatoes? Um, I've started them different times inside. And okay. late March, you can start them late. I don't think you really need to start them really early. Because okay. they're going to grow pretty fast once the weather gets warm and you get them in the garden. Um, and I've, I've kind of learned it's better to, to hold off. So every year I kind of 
rethink when I'm starting things. Yeah. I had I loved the paprika peppers and I started them too late last year. And I realized I needed to start them about a month earlier because they didn't have enough time to fully uh, mature. Do you um, put them in their pots or like that you would take outside originally, or do you? No, I started them in little cells and then I transplant them into a, another size pot. Yeah, and then they're fairly good size so that they're hardier by the time you get them into the garden. And then this is um, Salvia officinalis, or the culinary sage. Um, that is, it's just a beautiful plant. I love the leaves, the color, and the flowers the, are just, they attract the bees. So the honeybees are really challenged in North America, and this is like an early bloomer in the spring, and the, the bees are all over it. So this is just a young plant. Um, they fill out, and they can get a little larger, and then you can prune them. In subsequent years, but you know you'll just get this huge mass of bloom, and then you've got sage for your Thanksgiving turkey. Or do the deer like, like them? No, deer leave most salvias alone. Okay. Deer will. And I have a fence around the backyard, so most of the time the deer aren't able to get in. The gates left open. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. Okay, so this is July 7th. This is pink yarrow, and this was growing in the lawn, and so I just moved it a bit. But yarrow is a really, uh, it's a beautiful plant. It's, um, you can use it as an herb for winter illness, all kinds of things, and then it attracts beneficial insects. It has a fairly long season of bloom. You can <coughs> deadhead it, and it'll do a second flush of growth. You do have to control it a little because it spreads. And, um, so I take out some of it every <coughs> day to kind of contain it. And then this is Calendula officinalis in flower. And this is an annual, but um, I love it for the brightness, the, that orange color. You, the petals are um, edible, so you can pull them off the flower and sprinkle them in a salad looks really pretty. Or you can dry the, the flower petals and then use it in a tea in the winter. And then you can also dry the petals and you soak it in olive oil. You can make a sap. So it's a really good, the calendula of the sage together, you can make a skin sap with those. And then this is borage. This is another annual plant. It's a, purchase this from Terrapin and if you just get it once it recedes so readily that you're going to have it forever but I love the blue color and this you can pull the little flowers off and dry them or you can pull them off and they're really pretty if you make um, you just decorate things if you make a fruit salad you can throw those on it or just a regular green salad and it has vitamin B12 so it's not easy to find plants with vitamin and then um, this is July 12th. So the garlic has been harvested. And actually, with the garlic, I guess I missed that in one of the slides. I planted it up against the chain link fence. And you plant garlic here mid September to early October. It overwinters and then it continues to grow. And by mid July, it's ready to be harvested and you know that because the leaves start to brown at the tips mm -hmm. and then it shoots up this little flowering stem to call it a scape and it's just wild and curly and then once it straightens out you know that it's time to harvest the garlic and you cut the scapes mostly because they're going to take energy away from the garlic bulb that you want to harvest but some people will cut them when they're really tender and young and um, saute them. So that's also, you can eat that as well. And then this is, um, my son was living next door and he was 
growing peppers and eggplant and tomatoes in pots in front of his house. And he did put the deer netting um, around the area he was growing on. So it's west facing and it was on rock. So there's a lot of extra heat and everything thrived. So they, they loved it. And then this is July 16th, so this is tomatoes and basil, and this is a raised bed that I have just had to remove, dig a trench um, for some drainage, and so I tried to sift as many of the rocks out as I could and just mounded that soil and then got compost and planted into it. So did tomatoes and basil, and tomatoes and ba basil grow well together, they're good companions. And then this is one of the sunniest places in the garden. So the tomatoes like that warmth in the sun. So just kind of start thinking about where you're going to place things depending on what kind of sun there is. And then this is a, a central bed that um, once again I just flip the grass. You know, you just dig with a shovel and turn it upside down. Um, and then put compost on top and then plant it into it. So there's still a lot of dandelions everywhere <laughs> along the edge, but things grow in and this is a good, good, if you have a new garden and you have to do that, the winter squashes are great because they're going to cover that ground, keep it shaded. <clears throat> and then this is July 22nd, so potatoes, are being harvested. I planted those in mid-April. The potatoes are um, seem to grow really well here. So that's something you can harvest them early or you can leave them in the ground until the, the plant really dies back and harvest them in the fall. Either way. And then What's remaining are some peppers that are going to just stay in that bed until we get a frost. And then this is just a view of the garden on May 24th. So you can see how there's a lot of growth. Things have filled in. And then it might be a little hard to see, but I, the way I've been watering is overhead sprinkler and by hand, which takes time. I've got the time I can do it. but. If you do that, you're going to pay more attention to your, your plants. You're going to be noticing how they're doing. Um, so that's the rationale. And then I think, you know, it's really, I like watering early in the morning the best. You can water early in, in the morning or later in the evening, but not midday. It's not a good And then this is August 10th, so um, it just shows you how much more has filled in. Oops. Mm. Went too far. Sorry, we'll get back to it. Here we go. Okay, so this is August 10th, so by then the corn's ready to harvest. And in August, the sunflowers are just beautiful. So sunflowers are really good for um, a new garden because they will just, you know, help open up the soil. Um, they have a lot of biomass that you can compost. So it's a good way of starting a, a garden. And then usually what will happen, too, is there'll be enough seeds that drop underneath that they will just grow the next year. You don't necessarily need to plant them over and over again. And you're going to have a ton of songbirds. So the little goldfinches are usually all over them. And then this is August 11th. This is just, um, I love the pumpkin flowers. You know, they're just so incredible. Who needs the pumpkin? You've got the flower to look at, you know, and usually <laughs> There's an abundance of flowers, and this was just, this pumpkin was from, you know, the, the Halloween pumpkins from the fall before that it just put on the edge of the garden to compost, so it planted itself. 
And then this is August 27th. Um, zinnias are one of my favorite cut flowers or just flowers. And they actually attract a lot of beneficial insects, pollinators. And they have a fairly long season of flowering. So you, you get them going, you know, the end of July or so, and then until you get a really hard frost, they're still flowering. And then the bumblebees, I love this. I love in the summer just walking outside early in the morning with a cup of tea to look at the garden and see what's happening. So the zinnias, the little bumblebees use it as a bed. And it's like they're just hunkered down there. It's too cold for them to fly. And so you just sit there and you watch them. And then later on, they've taken off and they're ready for their day. This is just another view of winter squash and pumpkins and how much they cover, um, you know, the background. And then on the left, um, towards the top, the, the vine that's growing up on the fence, that surprised me that it just was, that fence was just tilted an angle. Um, and it just was making its way up. So I never thought about trying to grow pumpkins vertically like that, but you could. You could figure out a you wanted to save space. And this is August 11th, and it's just starting to get the tomatoes and peppers. And that's just so much fun to bring good food into the house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you grow peas? I do, and I'll have some okay. slides of that. Yeah. And then this is a, a, a raised bed. My son was taking some classes here at the community college, and they do the logger sport event and these rounds you know they, they chop and everything they were just going to burn them they had a huge pile it's cottonwood so he just brought a bunch home and we created some raised beds with this free material so you don't necessarily have to spend money or time or effort you know you can also keep your eyes open for and they do the logger sport event every year, too. Okay, and then this is August 11th, and it's just this, um, all these plants are in the ground, and along the edge of the sidewalk, I've got a lot of flowering plants, and the, the white is a lissom. It's a really good plant. It's cold hardy. One of the first things you can start growing, then it goes, you know, way into December almost. Um, and it attracts a lot of beneficial insects. And then the marigolds are really good, you know, just as far as discouraging some pests. Um, to the left of the marigolds are nasturtium. Nasturtium does really well here. Nasturtium is actually native to South America, the Andes. But it seems to like growing um, in cooler summer climates. So that's something that um, it takes them a little while to get started early in the summer, and then it just goes until you get a really hard frost. And the, the flowers are edible. They're kind of spicy, um, and, but they're really pretty. So there's just a, a lot of diversity in this bed, too. There are scallions, there's broccoli, there um, is basil. It's a little hard to see their tomatoes on the edge. And then this shows the raised beds. Um, this is August 11th. So I had harvested all the lettuce out of um, that bed and just kind of left the kale kind of <laughs> it'll fill in it grows and I did grow too much kale that year so that's the lesson it's really tempting to grow too much and then you realize okay that was too much I'm only going to do five plants next year um, and then this is September 11th and I love this because the cottonwood ground <coughs> under the pumpkin is a little mushroom growing out of the cottonwood so I would love to do that. You can um, buy mushroom spore, things like mushroom, um, oyster mushroom, shiitake mushroom, and you can inoculate logs. I want to learn to do that. And purple frog, Pam, was, she did a class last summer, 
and she was inoculating a bunch of um, wood on her farm. But that's another, um, mushrooms are just so nutritious and good. And then this is just September 15th, the pumpkins are mature, the corn is drying, the zinnias are still going. This is November 5th. Okay, this is broccoli. And broccoli, you get um, like a, a large head initially. You cut that, and then side shoots happen with smaller heads around it. And so if you keep cutting those heads, then you're not encouraging it to go to flower. But I let this one go to flower because the bees absolutely love the broccoli flowers. They were all over it. And they're just, you know, that time of year to have things to feed the bees is, is pretty cool. And then this is November 5th as well. And this is celery. <clears throat> and it's pretty cold hardy too. And then just to keep that in the garden and use it for Thanksgiving. You can also dry celery. You can dry parsley leaves. And it's actually really nice in the winter to be able to add that to a soup or, um, you know, a, a stew or whatever. And then these are Brussels sprouts. I keep trying to do Brussels sprouts. They're small here, but they're really good. Um, so every year I tell myself, okay, don't try to do the Brussels sprouts. <laughs> keep trying. And then this is just the, um, the dinosaur kale is really pretty. It's a little different texture and you can see how the lower stem has been harvested quite a bit. But it keeps going and it's still, I mean it's November 5th. You can still be out there harvesting and then on the right is arugula that I let go to flower and again the bees love um, arugula, broccoli, they're all related. So it's the same kind of flower that has some pretty good nectar in it. Okay, and then I'm kind of going back a bit. So now if you look on the far left, um, uh, on the other side of the chain link fence, that was my garden the summer I moved here. And then my son was living next door and he had already prepared these two beds in his yard. So that was kind of the first garden season that um, he did. And he did a pretty extensive process of removing the grass, setting it aside, digging out some more of the soil, and he put the grass back down in the hole, and then the soil back on top of it. A lot of work, but um, it got rid of the grass. The grass wasn't a problem. It wasn't coming back up through because it was deep enough. And then you do introduce a lot of oxygen to the soil, which can be a good thing. This is a really heavy clayish soil. Um, but I think you only need to do that once and then after that year, each year just put a layer of compost on top. Okay, and then this one was just to show you, you kind of think about how you're going to walk through your garden if you have a larger garden bed. So where the stepping stones are, I put cardboard down and then um, wood chips are in between and that works really well. Suppress weeds and um, you're not stepping and compressing the soil as much. And then this is just, she's doing another bed uh, for strawberries and then removing, there was a row of um, evergreens. And so you kind of get to the point, you go, wow, that's creating too much shade or it's not, doesn't make sense. We've transplanted those trees. Front yard is a living fence and they're happier in the front yard. <laughs> And then there's a more open site for the strawberries and cucumbers and things that came. Are strawberries full sun? They like some shade in the late afternoon. Okay. So they need some sun, but they don't like the hot afternoon. Okay. And then this is just a, a view of his garden with the corn in the background. And then we planted in blocks. There's um, the beets and the carrots. And I kind of like that style of doing things not in rows, but to do it in a block of about three feet square. That's a nice way to harvest and um, just kind of keep track of things. 
And then this is like um, just a shot of my favorite tools. So the shovel, the, um, the rake, the digging fork. The digging fork is great for harvesting potatoes or just loosening the soil. And then a couple different hand trowels, and I've got Felco clippers that um, I invested in years ago. And at the time, they were $30. This was back in the 90s, and I thought, wow, that's a lot of money to spend for clippers. But um, they're Swiss made. You can easily sharpen them. They have replaceable blades. Today, it goes for $90. So it just shows you what's happened to our currency over time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then two other tools I love. The Hori Hori is a little Japanese style knife. It's really good for weeding and it's also good for just planting things too. And then the little weasel edger, um, that's good for removing turf or just, you know, edging a, a, a bed. So that was the first season. I'm going to switch and go through last year, but do you, does anybody have any questions or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you prefer ground growing in the ground or in raised beds? I think the ground is preferable, to tell you the truth. But the thing about these raised beds is they are in contact with the ground. Mm -hmm. So. It's like a, a mixed blessing with the raised bed because it's going to warm up faster in the spring to plant things in, but then it's going to dry out more quickly too. So what you'll find is that it's harder to water a raised bed than it is to water something in the ground. I have a whole bunch. How high is your raised bed? So it's, you know, what's that, a foot? It's about a foot. You're about 16 inches. Okay, 16 inches. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that's the first one. Second question is, you're going in with soil and rotting material and you're covering it with card wet cardboard. Then you're putting on a layer of compost and on top of that you're putting in your potting soil. So, how deep is your potting soil at? Is it like two inches, four inches, six inches? You know, with, oh, I'd say it's, you know, what's that? Three, two, three, two, three uh, inches? Yeah. Just on top. And that's all you need if you're going to sow carrots or you're going to sow beets. Um, and then you've got the, the compost underneath that. So if you're going to transplant something like a little pepper seed lane or some basil, um, you know, you've got that extra depth where it's going in. Okay. Okay. How big? The, the compost, you know, I think you need about, you know, a foot. Okay. Or, 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 yeah. I don't know, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Six inches. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned at the start uh, about uh, the place where you got uh, uh, compost. The Kalispell Creamery. Mm -hmm. The creamery is out if you go out West Valley. Um, it's, it's, if you just, uh, yeah, you can look up their address and they have a website. It's Kelsbill uh, Creamery. And they're only open on Saturdays. Um, and I think it's from 10 to 4. And okay. then I don't, I don't know when they open in the spring. It's probably April. And that depends a little because I think um, if it's too wet, if there's too much snow, they're going to wait because it's pretty muddy where they have to. <coughs> scoop and bring it to your car. What kind of wood do you use for your raised beds? Um, that wood, the beds I purchased is cedar. cedar. But if I were going to, I did build another raised bed that's in this next um, set of slides, and I just used the dug fir, the thicker, so about two inch thick. And, and is there a problem? You say you use a pond lighter keep the soil away from the wood, which makes sense to me, but is there a problem you water it? Was there any water on the bottom that can't leak out? No, because the liner's only to, um, you know, it, it doesn't go across. Okay, under. it's just on the side. Yeah, and it's Got like, it. that's what you want. You 
want your bed to be in contact with the earth, with gotcha. the soil, because that way, I mean, it's pretty amazing. You'll have earthworms coming up into the beds sure. in, in a short period of time. And that's, we collect leaves in the fall and cover all the beds with leaves. And it's pretty interesting to see how you do get the worms. You get the night, big night crawlers and well, the little red wigglers. Um, so the previous owners of my house, they did like flowering beds, but then around their flowers, they did big rocks. <clears throat> um, and we've tried to get the rocks out, but it's impossible. We're, we, we just don't have patience for that. But we were thinking of putting raised beds over there. Uh, would that be okay? Like, would the, if we laid it straight on there, like you did with your planters, do you think things could get through? It would on the rock? Yeah. Um, you know, you'd be surprised. Nature is really powerful, and it right. will. Yes. Yeah. So as long as, sometimes with the rock, they'll put, um, like a, a fat landscape fabric down yep. first and then we rock on top and then that's going to make it harder for the worms and the little guys yes. to... We've torn up the okay. it's gone. liner. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's gone now. <laughs> yeah, you could just put it right on top. Oh, cool. Yeah. This is last year's season and this is February 18th. It looks a lot, it's even worse this year. There's yeah. more snow on these beds. The two beds on the left garlic was planted in late September. So it's just sitting there under the snow. And then this is by March 11th. The days are getting longer and the snow melts pretty fast. I mean, it's pretty interesting to see that change. And then this is March 11th. So started beets, spinach, gallium leaf, parsley. Uh, I don't use bottom heat because most vegetables will germinate between 60 and 70 degrees. And the basement stays about 60. And where I have my little light, grow light is right next to the furnace and the water heater. Okay. So then this is April 15th. I did way too much, too many beets last year. <laughs> and they, they just all germinated and they loved it. So I was giving beets away. Um, so this is April 15th and I put them in. I purchased a little bit larger cold frame and it just has a plastic cover. It was from Grower Supply. And it actually is pretty decent. You just need a little bit of protection um, for the, the nights. And then the rectangular beds on the right. In the far right, I had planted some fava beans. Fava beans are really good for putting nitrogen into your soil. They fix it and they grow pretty fast so you've got some good <coughs> organic matter for your garden the flowers are awesome they have um, they're white and black they have little nectaries so you'll attract some nice beneficial insects um, fava beans are really good they're a little bit of work to peel though so but I, I'm, I'm growing them mostly for the soil and just because i have such a heavy clay soil it helps to break that up and then the other long rectangular bed, I wanted to grow wheat, because I've never grown a grain before. And I just um, started making bread and got interested in it. And um, so I was glad I did. And wheat, you can use wheat, oats, you can also use in the garden to just feed your soil. So it can be like a, um, a rotational crop where where you planted pumpkins one year and then you do a little bit of wheat the next. And it's just it's it's just decorative and pretty and then I just wanted to know like how much would you have to grow to make one loaf of bread? So it's you know maybe about ten by twelve or something like that. So it kind of makes you think about food in a different way. Okay, so now this is April fifteenth and this is the garlic bread. And what I had done the previous fall is I had started some spinach and lettuces and after I planted the garlic in that bed then I transplanted the spinach and the lettuces in between where I had planted the garlic and they all overwintered together. So the spinach and the lettuce can actually go through a winter and then they're fine and they'll grow. So that's a trick to maybe get a little earlier harvest 
of a few things and then it's a way of utilizing the space in the bed so you don't have all that empty space between the garden plants. And then um, this bed I had some parsnips and they were just beginning to germinate so, and then radishes. And the radishes are going to be replaced with pepper plants, or you can replace them with basil plants. So the radishes are really good, they're fast, and then you can replant with some of your um, warm season plants. Okay, so this is April 22nd, and um, holes had been dug to plant potatoes, and they're in the ground. It still looks pretty barren, and then I transplanted some beets, and it's the little line along the center you can barely see. And then in between these two beds, I put rough mulch, and that was just from the top of the compost pile, because you don't want to step on bare ground, and then I was thinking it would hold the water in between the beds better. It's just like a, a little, and you're feeding, you're feeding that soil. And then um, on the far right, you can, nothing's evident now. It's April 22nd, but that's an asparagus bed. And there's a little bit of scallion that's starting to come up. This is April 22nd. The daffodils are flowering. And, you know, just even the first um, flowers are just so welcome. And daffodils are really good companions around apple trees. So each of the apple trees that do a little clump of daffodils, deer will eat daffodils. And then this is just showing the, the rough debris from the top of the compost pile is set aside so that I can use that in between the beds. And then this is just deconstructing the compost pile after winter. And the way I compost is probably not the proper way, but I just start when I'm weeding or pruning or whatever, I just lay it on the bed and just as I go the, the compost pile grows and then by winter you really at the bottom you've got quite a bit of really nice compost and it's full of worms so the worms are doing a lot of the work it's not heating up it's not going to kill weed seeds but it's encouraging all this other life so that's just um you know, the nice compost that I could either sift it or I could just put it on the bed and use it as it is. And then I, I used the wheelbarrow and these clippers to just chop that rough debris up so that it was easier to, to spread. And then this is like May 2nd, so after the daffodils, you get the tulips starting. And tulips are really worth growing. The garden is just starting to come to life. You can barely see a little bit of green on the shrubs. This is a long bed that um, is mostly perennial material, so this is from the other direction looking down. So what's in this bed, I mean, just looking at it, it might not look like a lot, but there are two service berries, two golden currants. Those are both native shrubs that um, fruit that you can, you can harvest. There are three grapevines, six blueberry <laughs> bushes. There are alpine strawberries, two hazelnuts, and elderberry. There's lavender, there's goldenrod, there's oregano, there's rose, there's mahonia, that's another native plant. Um, so that space looks pretty empty the first part of May. And then this is like a week later. And it's still, you can see that things have grown a little bit. It's a little bit more green. And then the center bed in front of the garage, starting to get compost down again and prepping that for the warm season. Things, I'll put tomatoes in there. There'll be some more winter squash. This is um, south side of the house. We've got two pear trees and then pots along the side of the house that I'll put tomatoes in. So <clears throat> that will reflect heat the tomatoes. So this <coughs> is spinach that has been transplanted into a raised bed. 
And then this is arugula, it's May 7th. I had some a couple weeks earlier, and then there are radishes down the center, carrots on either side of the radishes. The arugula, I just cut that over and over and over again. It sounded really thick, but it didn't seem to bother it. Um, and it kind of liked that, and it covered the soil initially, so you've got a lot of root mass underneath. It's kind of helping that soil. And this is May 7th, so the asparagus is ready to be harvested. And then this is the same, the bed with the garlic and the overwintered greens on May 7th. You can see the lettuces, the spinach has grown a bit. And then this is the, the center bed on May 7th. Um, got some perennial plants in there. So on the left is it kind of curves around. That's yarrow, the pink yarrow. There's a little bit of red clover. That's a good plant for the bees. It's also the flower you can harvest, and it's used as a um, kind of a, a medicinal plant. You can make a tea out of it. Um, and then lemon balm. Is, is a perennial that comes back every year. So I like having a mix of some open space for the annuals, but you've got some perennial plants as well. And then this is May 7th, and that's the bed with the cottonwood grounds. And still the leaves are kind of evident from what we put on there in the fall. The little compost that we're starting to put on top. There's some garlic and scallions that are growing. I'll put peppers and wheat in that bed a little later. Okay, so here are the peas. So this is another, I um, kind of just put this raised bed together myself. So it's just duck fur and um, open bottomed. And so the um, peas and lettuces are good companions. They like growing together. I soak the peas in warm water for about four hours before sowing them directly. And I did that on April 7th. And then the lettuces I had started inside and um, transplanted. And then this just shows the second round of seedlings that are in the little cold frame. Um, so there's corn, there are the tomatoes and peppers in there. And then this is June 20th. So you can see how the peas have grown, the lettuce has grown, the peas are ready to harvest. What are the peas growing up? Those are just um, some little trellises that I had. And then you have a pot of um, lemon um, grass. That's a warm season plant that I love growing that for tea. So it just it, it'll just get huge in that pot. Um, and then you harvest it and you just dry it. It's a nice, nice winter tea. And then it's just it's a pretty plant throughout the summer. And then this is June 20th, so sunflowers are growing quickly. That center bed has got the wheat. You can just see how the garden's filling in. The tomatoes, June 20th, um, are planted up against the house. This is sunflower bud. I can't help <laughs> taking pictures of I mean, it's just amazing the architecture of some of the flowers. And even the sunflower, the center of it, it has all these spiral patterns. Okay, then this is the goldenrod, the lavender, um, the, the borage, the calendula. And it just becomes kind of a wild jumble, but <clears throat> there are winter squash that are going to be, that are growing behind that. And then uh, this is June 20th. The garlic is maturing. It's almost ready to be harvested. Then July 20th, it's it's been harvested. So what I do is I take it in the garage and I'll put it in clumps of about eight or ten and just hang it to dry and dry it for you know three weeks, something like that. And then it stores in the basement. It likes to stay at about 60 degrees, so the basement's perfect for that. Okay, then this is July 30th. So not really harvesting a lot of um, warm season things yet, but there's kale, chard, scallions, carrots, and then the flowers are just taken off. So it's really neat to enjoy the flowers. And then this is just a, a beautiful one bed that has, so 
So it's parsley, chard, kale, um, scallions. There's a little scruffy flower that's coming off to the left. That's buckwheat. And that's a really good um, plant to plant for be attracting beneficial insects. And it also helps you so just grow your soil. So it grows fast, it likes warm weather. Um, <coughs> And I have used that different places just as a filler, and so I don't really even sow it intentionally. Around. It just kind of grows on its own. Then this is um, eggplant in pots. Eggplant peppers love being in the pots. And then this is the bed that has the <coughs> garlic. What I did after harvesting the garlic is I put basil in the back. And then in between the basil, I sowed carrot seed. And then there's some pepper plants in front. And then two peanut plants. So the neighbor feeds the birds and the jays and the squirrels. And they bury the peanuts. And then they started growing it. I thought, okay, I'm going to try to grow a peanut and see what happens. But um, they did flower. And it's a really cool little yellow flower. But we just don't have the heat um, for peanuts. so. That was an experiment. <laughs> and then the other bed that had the garlic, I sowed oats and then cilantro. And then this center bed had a ton of different things. It had cauliflower, the zinnias, the yarrow, the tomatoes, winter squash, um, lots of herbs. And then July 31st is when I harvested the cauliflower. It's the first time I've ever grown cauliflower. And there were 10 beautiful heads of cauliflower. So some of that we just had, ate it raw, some of it was just, just um, roasted, and some put in the freezer. So it just, it freezes pretty well too. And then this is looking to the south um, on July 30th and across the fence. All the corn I started, I planted over in my son's yard. So this is another idea. If you don't have enough space in your garden for everything, Maybe you can get your neighbor to grow something. <laughs> you can try it. And then that's just a shot of his garden. The strawberry bed is in. Um, there's also rhubarb in there. There's lovage. Um, the center of the chain link fence, the cucumbers were growing. And the cucumbers love that, you know, something to, to grow on. So if you happen to have a chain link fence, it's not a bad thing. Then this is just a, a shot of his garden, and it's just corn with their potatoes and all kinds of peppers, tomatillas. This is August 18th, so we've got um, the basil filling in. The carrots are maybe about three inches. And then this is August 18th, so the oats have grown quite a bit. They grow pretty quickly, and the, the cilantro's starting to take off. Then the tomatoes um, are doing doing well. The, the tomato in the biggest pot is a sun gold, and by the end of the season, it was covering the windows. I mean, it just kept going up, and you know, it's just like the heat from the house is is perfect for the tomatoes because they don't cool down too much at night. It's got that. And then um, this is just the pears are really pretty, and they started getting a little bit of color. This is August 18th, and I kept testing to see if they're ready. It took until like mid-October before they were ready. And then you really are supposed to take off cold, the smaller ones, so that just all the energy goes into the few that you've selected. And I did that a bunch, but you just get to the point where you just want <laughs> It's hard. It's hard thinning things. And then this is August 18th, so the corn is ready to harvest. And then this is just showing that um, curry squash is growing, you know, under the corn amongst the corn. And I had planted pole beans right after putting the corn transplants in. And so had the three sisters system that year, the corn, beans, and squash. And the beans are just let them dry and then harvested them for, you know, soups. And then this bed has the parsnips that were sown, and then these are the paprika peppers that just didn't have enough time to 
to mature. This is August 20th, so I had harvested basil, and I've got garlic from the garden, and I'm ready to make pesto. So I love pesto, you can just freeze it, and usually try to do several batches every year. And this is um, little Sochi plums that are really delicious, and we've got some blackberries, there's a blackberry patch. And then the corn is ready for the freezer. And then this is after the basil was harvested. You can see how the carrots have grown. They've got a little bit more room. But I didn't take the basil plants out. I just kind of um, cut them close. And then they were able to, to push a little bit more growth. And then here, the September 6th, the cilantro is ready to be harvested. The oats, I was hoping that they would have time. They did flower, but they didn't have time to mature the seed. This is September 6th, and the zinnias are still beautiful. And it's a little hard to see, but it's nasturtium in front of the zinnias. That's a nice combination. Combination the nasturtium are lower, and um, the same range of colors. You get some really pretty oranges and yellows, and, and then the zinnias are a little taller. So. And then got some uh, grapes, the reliance. So it's starting to get a little color. Um, but they're not really ready. And grapes, they can stay on the vine. They can go through a little bit of a frost and it doesn't bother them. And then this is a, a winter squash that's just growing in the shade of an apple tree, almost ready to harvest. It's September 6th. This is potatoes that have been harvested, se September 6th. And then this I love, the eggplant. You can just see how some of these just are so, um, they're so happy in the pots. And then there were so many eggplant. I had been already harvesting it. Just barbecue them. Just put a little olive oil on it and put it on the grill. Eggplant's <laughs> really good. And then this is just a, an apple tree. It's not, it's getting some color. This is September 6th, but it's not really ready. It takes till mid-October for it to really get sweet. And then these are the, the um, parsnips harvested on August or October 24th. So we've gotten a little bit of a cold snap. They need that cold to kind of develop their sugars. They were really hard to get out of the bed. I struggled to pull them out. And then some of them, they just they broke. <laughs> <laughs> because the ground had started to freeze? Or? No, they were just... I think it's just they're a strong plant. And then, I mean, the bed was mostly, it was compost and stuff, but the roots went down pretty deep, and I think they were going into some of that more clay type subsoil. And then this is October 24th, so we're gathering neighbor's leaves. There's some really great maple trees next door, and I just go say, can I have your leaves? So they're happy not to have to rake them into the street and we just cover the garden. And then this is the garlic has been planted. The, those beds are ready for winter. And then this is October 24th. Um, just kind of the asparagus is starting to get some yellow color. Still have um, carrots that could be harvested. There are leeks that could be harvested. Um, and then this is the theme of three, three the Seeds this year community food system to think about that. And so I was kind of um, inspired when I found out that the original meaning of the Greek word for economy, economia, is the family within the home, within the garden. When we think about that, you know, the way our economy is so out of balance with values these days, that if you have your own backyard vegetable garden, you are following this whole cycle. You're producing it, you're processing it. You walk, your distribution is you're walking 10 feet or 20 feet or whatever. You're eating it right at home and then you're composting. So you're doing this whole cycle in your backyard. So I just wish you all well with your garden season and you went over. <laughs>